tomorrow morning on ABC7 Eyewitness News. I'm Gene Gleason. D-H-E-A. It's the hottest thing in health stores, but what can it do for you? I'm Alicia Lee. Getting ready to face the freeway tomorrow morning? Newscopter 7 will track the trouble spots for you. I'm Johnny Mountain. Will your Thursday morning be fair or foggy? Join us at 5.36 and 6.30 for Eyewitness News. It's all tomorrow on Eyewitness News at 5.36 and 6.30 a.m. only on ABC7. Learn Cindy Crawford's makeup secrets tomorrow's Oprah. This is an ABC News special. The 96 vote. Live coverage of the second presidential debate from San Diego, California. Now reporting, Peter Jennings. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our coverage of the second and the last presidential debate of Campaign 96, or to be more precise, the second and last joint appearance by Mr. Dole and President Clinton. Tonight's town meeting in San Diego was set up to be even less of a debate than their first meeting a week and a half ago. It is possible, we know, to exaggerate the expectations about this encounter, but it is true that in both campaigns, not to mention in much of the press, there's a pretty strong feeling that if Mr. Dole doesn't make a more persuasive argument to vote against Mr. Clinton or for Bob Dole, then he is not going to get another such opportunity. They meet in California at a time when the national polls, including our tracking poll, still reflect a significant and stable advantage for the president. And many polls, including California, to continue to support the popular notion that Mr. Clinton has a perhaps insurmountable lead. Once again tonight, the moderator is going to be Jim Lehrer from Public Television, and he's going to tell us all about the audience and the ground rules. So we now go to the campus at the University of San Diego, where President Clinton and Senator Dole are already in front of their audience. Good evening from the Shiley Theater at the University of San Diego, San Diego, California. I'm Jim Lara of the News Hour on PBS. Welcome to the second 1996 presidential debate between Senator Bob Dole, the Republican nominee, and President Bill Clinton, the Democratic nominee. It is sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. We will follow a town hall type format tonight. The questions over the next 90 minutes will come from 113 citizens of the greater San Diego area. They were chosen in the past week by the Gallup organization to represent a rough cross-section of voters as to political views, age, gender, and other factors. Each said he or she is undecided about this presidential race. They were told to come tonight with questions. Nobody from the debate commission or the two campaigns has any idea what those questions are. Neither do I. We will all be hearing them for the first time at the same time. I met with this group three hours ago, and we spoke only about how it was going to work tonight. They are sitting in five sections. I will call on individuals at random, moving from one section to another with each new question, alternating the questions between the two candidates. My job is to keep things fair and the subjects as clear and as varied as possible. The rules drawn by the campaigns are basically the same as they were for the Hartford and St. Petersburg debates. 90 second answers, 60 second rebuttals, 30 second responses for each question. The candidates are not allowed to question each other directly. There will be two minute opening and closing statements. The order for this evening was set by coin toss. We begin now with Senator Dole and his opening statement. Senator Dole. Thank you very much, Jim. Let me first give you a sports update. The Braves won, Cardinals nothing early on. I want to thank you and I want to thank everybody here tonight. I want a special thanks to my wife Elizabeth and my daughter Robin for their love and support and thank the people who are listening or watching, watching all over America. In 20 days, you will help decide who will lead this country into the next century. It's an awesome responsibility. And you must ask yourself, you know enough about the candidates. You should know as much as possible about each of us. Sometimes uh, the views have been distorted. There's been millions and millions of negative dollars in negative advertising spent distorting my views. But I hope tonight you'll get a better feel of who Bob Dole is and what he's all about. And I think first you should, I should understand that 
question on your mind is, do I understand your problem? Would I understand it if it occurred to me? And I might just say that I'm from a large family. I got lots of relatives. And they're good, average, middle class, hardworking Americans. They live all across the country. They're not all Republicans. Maybe all but one. But in any event, <laughs> I understand the problem. Whether it's two parents working because one has to pay the taxes and one has to provide for the family, whether it's a single parent who just barely pays the pressing bills, or whether you're worried about an education for your children, or going to the best schools, or whether you're worried about safe playgrounds, drug-free schools, crime-free schools. This is what this election is all about. And hopefully tonight, when we conclude this debate, you will have a better understanding and the viewing and listening audience will have a better understanding. Thank you. Mr. President, two minutes, opening statement. I was going to applaud too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jim, and uh, thanks to the people of San Diego for giving us this opportunity to have another discussion about the decision we all face in front of people who will make the decision. Again, I will say I'll do my best to make this a discussion of ideas and issues, not insults. What really matters is what happens to your future and what happens to our country as we stand on the brink of a new century, a time of extraordinary possibility. I have a simple philosophy that I've tried to follow for the last four years. Do what creates opportunity for all, what reinforces responsibility from all of us, and what will help us build a community where everybody's got a role to play and a place at the table. Compared to four years ago, we're clearly better off. We've got 10 and a half million more jobs. The deficit's been reduced by 60%. Incomes are rising for the first time in a decade. The crime rates, the welfare rolls are falling. We're putting 100,000 more police on the street. 60,000 felons, fugitives, and stalkers have been denied handguns. But that progress is only the beginning. What we really should focus on tonight is what we still have to do to help the American people make the most of this future that's out there. I think what really matters is what we can do to help build strong families. Strong families need a strong economy. To me, that means we have to go on and balance this budget while we protect Medicare and Medicaid and education and the environment. We should give a tax cut targeted to child rearing and education, to buying a first home and paying for health care. We ought to help protect our kids from drugs and guns and gangs and tobacco. We ought to help move a million people from welfare to work. And we ought to create the finest education system in the world, where every 18-year-old can go on to college and all of our younger children have great educational opportunities. If we do those things, we can build that bridge to the 21st century. That's what I hope to get to talk about tonight. Thank you. All right, let's go now to the first question from this section, and it's for Senator Dole. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Hello, Senator Dole. My name Hi. is Shannon McAfee. Um, <coughs> I'm a beginning educator in this country, and I really think it's important what children have to say. They're still very idealistic, and they, everything they say comes from the heart. I have a quote for you from if I were president, compiled by Peggy Gavin. A sixth grader says, if I, would pres if I were president, I would think about Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and what they did to make our country great. We should unite the white and black people and people of all cultures. Democrats and Republicans should unite also. We should all come together and think of the best ways to solve the economic problems of our country. I believe that when we are able to come together and stop fighting amongst ourselves, we will get along a lot better. These are the ideals and morals that we are, teach, we are trying to teach our children in these days. Um, yet we don't seem to be practicing them in our government in anything. If you are president, how will you begin to practice what we are preaching to our children, the future of our nation? Well, I would say, first of all, I think it's a very good question. I appreciate the quote from the young man. There's no doubt about it that many American people have lost their faith in government. They see scandals almost on a daily basis. They see ethical problems in the White House today. They see 900 FBI files 
private person being gathered up by somebody in the White House. Nobody knows who hired this man. So there's a great deal of cynicism out there. But I've always tried, in whatever I've done, is to bring people together. I said in my acceptance speech in San Diego about two months ago, if the exits are clearly marked, if you think the Republican Party is some place for you to come if you're narrow-minded or bigoted or don't like certain people in America, the exits are clearly marked for you to walk out of as I stand here without compromise, because this is the party of Lincoln. I think we have a real obligation, obviously public officials. I'm no longer a public official. I left public life on June the 11th of this year. But it is very important. Young people are looking to us. They're looking to us for leadership. They're watching what we do, what we say, what we promise, and what we finally deliver. And I would think, it seems to me, that there are opportunities here. When I'm president of the United States, I will keep my word. My word is my bond. Mr. President? One of the reasons that I ran for president, Sandy, is because not just children, a lot of grown-ups felt that way. And if you remember, four years ago, we had not only rising unemployment, but a lot of rising cynicism. I'd never worked in Washington as an elected official. It seemed to me that uh, most of the arguments were partisan, Republican, Democrat, left, right, liberal, conservative. That's why I said tonight I'm for opportunity, responsibility, and community. And we've gotten some real progress in the last four years. I've also done everything I could at every moment of division in this country, after Oklahoma City, when these churches were burned, to bring people together and remind people that we are stronger because of our diversity. We have to respect one another. You mentioned Washington and Lincoln. They were presidents of historic times. This is an historic time. It's important that we go beyond those old partisan arguments and focus on people and their future. When we do that, instead of shutting the government down over a partisan fight on the budget, we're a better country, and that's why we're making progress now. Senator? Well, bringing people together, again, is uh, obviously a responsibility we all have. I know you do it. Everybody here does it. You do a lot of things nobody knows about. I have a little foundation for the disabled called the Dole Foundation. We've raised about $10 million. We don't talk about it. We try to help people with disability, bring them back into the mainstream of public life. So it seems to me that there's also a public trust. When you're the president of the United States, you have a public trust. And you have to keep that public trust, as George Washington and as Abraham Lincoln did. And I think now that trust is being violated and it seems to me we ought to face up to it, and the president ought to say tonight that he's not going to pardon anybody that he was involved in business with who might implicate him later on. All right, the next question from this section right here, right there in the middle, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Robert Berkeley, uh, I'm a cardiologist from uh, Fallbrook, California. Um, Mr. President, I'd like to know um, if you'd please explain your plans for, uh, in a substantive fashion, for uh, addressing the problems with the health care system in our country? I will. First of all, let me say what we have done. In the last four years, we've worked hard to promote more competition to bring down the rate of inflation in health care costs without eroding health care quality. The government pays for Medicare and Medicaid, as you know, and that's very important. Secondly, we've added a million more children to the ranks of the insured through the Medicaid program. We have protected 25 million people through the passage of the kennedy Casabon bill that says you can't use your health insurance if you change jobs or if someone in your family's been sick. We just recently ended those drive-by deliveries saying people couldn't be kicked out of the hospital by insurance companies when they just had babies. So this is, that's a good start. In the next four years, I want to focus on the following things. Number one, add another million children to the insured ranks through the Medicaid program. Number two, keep working with the states as we are now to add 2.2 million more people to the insured system. Number three, cover people who are between jobs for up to six months. That could protect 3 million families, 700,000 kids. And number four, make sure we protect the integrity of the Medicare program and the Medicaid program and not do anything in cutting costs, which would cause hundreds of hospitals to close, as could have been the case if the $270 billion Medicare cut that I vetoed 
had been uh, enacted into law. Well, so first let me say, there you go again, Mr. President, talking about a Medicare cut. I've heard you say this time after time. I've heard you say on one TV appearance, the media made me do it. You were trying to defend your cut, which was not a cut either, reduction in the growth of spending. And we always had uh, at least 7%. Uh, You've said publicly that is now three times the rate of inflation. We ought to cut the growth to twice the rate of inflation. That's about where we are now. So let's stop talking about cutting Medicare. And my economic plan will increase at 39%. Don't forget what he tried to do with health care. 17 new taxes, spend $1.5 trillion, 50 new bureaucracies. Can you believe that? You couldn't even been a cardiologist because he had quotas. Yet you couldn't, your cardiologist wouldn't affect you. But if somebody wanted to be a cardiologist, 10 years from now, you'd have to be certain you complied with some of the rules in this extreme medical plan the government was going to take over for all Americans. There are things we can do, like the Casabon bill, which contains many provisions that I authored, cover pre-existing existing portability, and there are other things we can do. We still need to cover about 20 million people and a lot of children. I don't have time in 30 seconds to respond to fix all that, but let me just say, the American Hospital Association said that the budget I vetoed could have closed 700 hospitals, not me. And on a per-person basis, it did cut way below the rate of inflation and medical costs. But the important thing is, what are we going to do now? We need to help people who are between jobs. We need to cover more kids. We need to provide more preventive care. My balanced budget covers mammograms for ladies and women on Medicare, and also gives respite care to the million-plus families who have someone with Alzheimer's. These things are paid for in the balanced budget plan. It'll move us forward. Next question is for Senator Dole from here. Yes, sir. Senator Dole, my name is Jason Milligan, uh, active duty military and a small business owner. And my question is, uh, what is your position on closing the gap between military and civilian pay scales? Jason, I appreciate that very much, being a former military man myself. You know, we have 17,000 men and women today wearing our uniform to receive food stamps. It shouldn't happen in America. We have men and women wearing our uniform in substandard housing. It shouldn't happen in America. And it's time we take a look at the pay scales. We did get a 3% increase this year, but that's not enough. If we're going to ask young men and young women to protect us and defend us around the world, and we've had more deployments under this administration than any time in history. 50 times we've deployed troops around the world. Every time you do that, you take a risk. Somebody you know, maybe your son, maybe your grandson, maybe somebody else. But I think anybody who wears uniform is a great American. Remember Vietnam, remember when people almost used to walk across the street rather than have contact with somebody who was in Vietnam. That's all behind us now, and it should be behind us. And the Forgotten War, the Korean War. But I guess uh, I can just answer you very plainly, Jason. Thank you for doing what you're doing. America owes you a debt of gratitude. May I ask you a question? What kind of, what service are you in? I'm in the United States Navy, sir. And what kind of small business do you have? I have an Amway business. Good for you. Well, let me say, if Senator Dole mentioned this, I just signed a bill that we got through Congress to increase the amount of pay increase we could give for military personnel and to make sure the pay increase this year was above the rate of inflation. I also have presented to the Congress, and they adopted a large package of quality of life improvements, which are very important. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking to military families as well as military members uh, all over the world and in bases all across the United States. And I became convinced after talking to the families and the personnel in uniform that we needed to not only have the pay raise, but we needed to invest more in child care, housing, and other things to support families, especially when they're longer deployments because of the downsizing of the military. So I, we're going to do better, and we'll do better still. But this is a commitment I think that all Americans share without regard to party. Well, Jason, I, I don't disagree with anything the President said, except he waited four years to do these things. And my view is it ought to be, it'll be done on day one. We'll start working on on day one in the Dole Kemp administration. This is important. And we only have 10 divisions now. We used to have 18. We had 25 fighter wings, we're down to 13. We have 536 ships, we're down to 336 ships. 
mean, we, we've cut defense spending too much in the first place. The president told you in 92 he would cut it 67 billion. He cut 112 billion dollars. We're right on the edge right now. But the last thing we ought to do is make those who wear the uniform sacrifice. Next question here for President Clinton. Yes, ma'am, here on the front row. President Clinton, my name is Cecily Kelly. Um, yesterday, Yasser Arafat uh, said uh, in uh, Palestine that he thinks the key to success in the Middle East is the commitment of Americans. Would you, as president, uh, send American troops to Israel or the West Bank as peacekeepers? Let me just take two seconds of my time because I'm the commander in chief to respond to one thing that was said. I propose to spend $1.6 trillion on defense between now and the year 2002, and there's less than 1% difference between my budget and the Republican budget on defense. Now, on the Middle East, as you know, I work very hard for peace in the Middle East. The agreement between the Palestinians and the Israelis was signed at the White House, and the agreement, the peace treaty with Jordan, I was went to Jordan and signed that, be there. but. Uh, and I think the United States can do whatever we reasonably can. I can say this. I, I do not believe Yasser Arafat wants us to send troops to the West Bank. Uh, we have never been asked to send troops to the West Bank. I saw the agreement that Prime Minister Rabin and Yasser Arafat signed on the West Bank. It had 26 separate maps they had to sign, literally thousands of delineations of who would do what on the West Bank. And I believe if the parties will get together and in a good faith manner make that agreement, that they'll be able to do it. If we cannot impose a peace on the Middle East, my position has always been that the job of the United States was to minimize the risks of peace. Uh, you know, if they ask me to, to be part of some uh, monitoring force, as we are in the Sinai and have been since 1978, to monitor the peace between Egypt and Israel, uh, frankly, I, I would have to think about it. I'd have to see what they wanted to do. But I don't believe that will be the request. I think what Mr. Arafat wants us to do is to make sure that everybody honors the agreements they've already made. That's why I brought the leaders to Washington a few days ago. I think they will, and I think we'll get there. Don't be too discouraged. Well, let me, Jason, come back to you a minute, because there is a big difference in the defense budget. We had $7 billion this year and $10 billion more than the president. He puts his money in the out years, even if he were reelected. You know, he'd be gone before anything happened, and nothing's going to happen. Because if we don't have modernization now, if we don't build more B-2 bombers in California, you know, we lost about 500,000 jobs out in California because of this devastation, these big, big cuts. We had to make cuts. We didn't have to make the cuts the president promised he'd make, and he doubled. And so I think we need to go back and take a look. We're increasing defense reasonably, not too much, but we are increasing defense some because we want to be prepared in case somebody here gets called up, Jason. I would say I didn't hear what Yasser Arafat had to say, but I don't want to, you know, I think foreign policy, I'm going to be very careful about. And I'm not here to argue about the president or some ongoing foreign policy matter. What I want the president to do, I think he may have done it, this last statement, call for an unconditional end of the violence and have the parties keep on talking as they should talk and have a resolution. The last thing we want to do is commit more forces anywhere. But let's sort of keep this out of politics because it's pretty dicey right now. When the change of government occurred in Israel, the people of Israel were saying, we don't want to abandon the peace process, we want more security. Then a lot of mutual distrust developed, a lot of things happened which maybe shouldn't have happened. When I asked Yasser Arafat and Prime Minister Netanyahu to come to Washington and got them together and they talked alone for three hours, I was convinced that they had to have a chance to make that peace. Again, I'd say if they ask us to play some reasonable role, I don't know how I would respond. It would depend entirely on what they ask us to do. But the real secret there is for them to abide by the agreements they've made and find a way to trust each other. And they're going to have to spend some time and trust each other. Prime Minister Rabin gave his life believing that that trust could be materialized, and I still think it can be. All right, next question from this section, and it is for Senator Dole. Back in the back. Yes, sir. Right there. Yes, sir. Uh, Senator Dole, Oscar Delgado. Oscar. Uh, Ex-smoker for 30 years. Uh, th th about 30 years ago, I was a pack plus a day man, okay? You mentioned a statement you, you said some time ago that you, you didn't think nicotine was addictive. 
Would you care to, uh, are you still close to that statement or do you wish to recant or explain yourself? Oh, that, that's very easy. My record going back to 1965 in the Congress, the first vote we had was whether or not you should put a little notice on cigarettes. They may be dangerous. I voted, for, I voted for everything since that time. In fact, 1992, we had a bill come before us that all the states had to comply or they're going to lose certain money. We sent it to the Clinton administration for implementation. They waited three and a half years. And during that period, about 3,000 young kids every day started smoking. So you add it up, that's about 3 million. Not until again, 1996. I don't want anybody to smoke. My brother probably died partly because of cigarettes. I was asked a technical question. Are they addictive? Maybe they probably are addictive. I don't know, I'm not a doctor. You shouldn't smoke. You ought to be glad you quit, Oscar. 30 years? Yeah. And it seems to me that what we need to do is to talk about not only tobacco, but drugs. Because drug use to 12 and 17 year olds has doubled in this administration the last 44 months. Marijuana use is up 141%. Cocaine use up 160%. They're your kids. It's all happened in this administration because they cut funding and they cut interdiction. When I'm president of the United States, we're going to use the National Guard and whatever sources we need to stop some of the drugs coming into America. If you stop the drugs, nobody's going to use the drugs. So don't smoke, don't drink, don't use drugs. Just don't do it. Oscar, the, uh, the question of what the federal government should do to limit the access of tobacco to young people is one of the biggest differences between Senator Dole and me. We did propose a regulation six months after I became president under the law he mentioned. It simply says all these states have made it illegal for kids to smoke. Now they have to try harder if they want to keep getting federal funds. Then we took comments, as we always do, and there were tens of thousands of comments about how we ought to do it. That's what drug it out. Meanwhile, we started, also in 93, to look into whether cigarettes were addictive enough for the Federal Food and Drug Administration to ban the ability of cigarette companies to advertise, market, and distribute tobacco products to our kids. No president had ever taken on a tobacco lobby before. I did. Senator Dole opposed me. He went down and made a speech to people who were on his side saying that I did the wrong thing. I think I did the right thing. On drugs, I have repeatedly said drugs are wrong and illegal and can kill you. We have strengthened enforcement. Everybody in San Diego knows we've strengthened control of the border. We've done a lot more. I hope we get a chance to talk about it. Well, they also know if they live in San Diego, Mr. President, if you're caught with 125 pounds of marijuana or less, you go back to Mexico. You're not prosecuted. You have a U.S. attorney here that sends them back home. So I think that's pretty important. That's a lot of marijuana. That's a big supply. But don't, you know, don't get into this smoke screener, Oscar. The president in the election year decided, well, I ought to do something. I have nothing on drugs. I've been AWOL for 44 months. So let's take on smoking. But see, they haven't even done it. They haven't said what's going to happen, whether they're going to have it declared addictive. It's going to apply just to, once it's a drug, does it apply only to teenagers or to everybody in America? Nobody should smoke, young or old, but particularly young people should not smoke. And my record is there. It's been there. I voted eight, ten times since 1965. Next question is for uh, President Clinton, and it comes uh, from right here. Yes, sir. President Clinton, my name is Jack Black. I'm a retired Air Force pilot. Uh, sir, it's officially forecast that our annual Medicare and Social Security deficits are measured in the trillions of dollars next century. Depending on who you listen to, Social Security will be bankrupt in either 2025 or 2030. I feel this is grossly unfair, especially to our younger generations who are losing faith in the system. My question is this. Assuming you agree that our entitlement programs are on an unsustainable course, what specific reforms do you propose? First of all, they're, they're two different things. Social Security and Medicare are entirely different in terms of the financial stability. So let's talk about them separately. Social Security is stable until, as you pointed out, at least the third decade of the next century. But we'd like to have a Social Security fund that has about 70 years of life instead of about 30 years of life. What we have to do is simply to make some adjustments that take account of the fact that the baby boomers, people like me, are bigger in number and the people that went just before us and the people that come just after us. 
And I think what we'll finally do is what we did in 1983 when Senator Dole served, and this is something I think he did a good job on. He served on the Social Security Commission, and they made some modest changes in Social Security to make sure that it would be alive and well for into the 21st century. And we will do that. But it's obvious that there are certain things that have to be done, and there are 50 or 60 different uh, options, and a bipartisan commission to take it out of politics will make recommendations and build support for the people. Medicare is different. Medicare needs help now. I have proposed a budget which would put 10 years on the life of the Medicare Trust Fund. It's more than it's had a lot of the time for the last 20 years. It would save a lot of money through more managed care, but giving more options, more preventive care, uh, and lowering the inflation rate and the prices we're paying providers without having the kind of big premium increases and out-of-pocket costs that the budget I vetoed would provide. Then that will give us 10 years to do with Medicare what we're going to do with Social Security have a bipartisan group, look at what we have to do to save it when the baby boomers retire. But now we, can, we ought to pass this budget now and put 10 years on it right away so no one has to worry about it. Well, again, if, you know, if you're somebody uh, thinking about the future, I think it's fair to say that it'll be, we'll work it out. I mean, this is a political year and the president's playing politics with Medicare, but after this year is over, we'll resolve it just as we did at Social Security in 1983. It's a nonpartisan commission. Ronald Reagan got together with Tip O'Neill and Howard Baker, two Republicans and one Democrat. They appointed a commission. I was on that commission. We resolved, we rescued Social Security. We suggested, uh, I think it's been over a year ago now, we do the same with Medicare, and the White House called it a gimmick. Now, last week, I guess it was, Donald Shalala said, well, we'll cut Medicare $100 billion and we'll appoint a commission. It'll probably have to be done by a commission. Take it out of politics. I think if I were a senior citizen, I'd be a little fed up with all these ads scaring seniors, scaring veterans, and scaring students about education. But when you don't have any ideas, you don't have any agenda, and all you have is fear, that's all you can use. We have ideas in the Dole Camp campaign, and we'll rescue Medicare as we did Social Security. Their idea was to have the poorest seniors in the country pay $270 more a year this year. Their idea was to budget that the, that the American Hospital Association said could close 700 hospitals. Their idea was to charge everybody more out-of-pocket costs in their budget that I vetoed. Not in an election year, sir. I told them in early 95. Senator Dole said 30 years ago he was one of 12 people that voted against Medicare, and he was proud of it. A year ago, he said, I was right then. I knew it wouldn't work. American seniors have the highest life expectancy in the world. We need to reform it, not wreck it. Next question from here, and it's for uh, Senator Dole. Yes, ma'am, right here. Yes. Senator Dole, my name is Suzanne Gonzalez, and okay. I would like to know what you are. What would be your first step in reforming welfare? Well, we've taken the first step. Took it three steps. Twice we sent welfare reform to the president, and he vetoed it. On the third time we sent welfare reform to the president, he signed it but announced he would change it next year, and the vice president said they were going to do something else through the line item veto, which I've never understood, but that's sort of inside baseball. What we need to do is make certain we try to return people to work. And I'm standing here as someone who a long time ago, as a county attorney in Russell, Kansas, one of our jobs every month was to do all the welfare checks and sign them. And three of those checks were my grandparents. So I know what it's like to have to look welfare head on. Obviously, some people are going to need help. This is the United States of America. You're not going to go without food, and you're not going to go without medical care. This is America. But at the same time, if you want to get off Medicare, get back in the mainstream, we're going to provide jobs. We're going to say you have a five-year five limit can be on welfare. You've got two years to look for a job. We provided more money for daycare in the bill that passed the Senate, was vetoed, then it came back. The President signed pretty much the same bill. But this is an important issue. I don't think we ought to be giving welfare payments to illegal immigrants. You know, it puts a heavy burden on a state like, except for emergencies, puts a heavy burden on states like California. It costs California taxpayers $3 billion a year. President Clinton? Get out of your way here. It's illegal right now and has been for years 
for illegal immigrants to get welfare benefits. Let me say that this is one of the most important issues in the world to me. I started working on welfare reform in 1980 because I was sick of seeing people trapped in a system that was increasingly physically isolating them and making their kids more vulnerable to get in trouble. So I've been working on it when I was a governor for a long time. When I became president, I used the authority I had in this law to get out from under certain federal rules to help states move people to work. We've reduced the welfare rolls by two million already. Now I've got a plan with this new welfare reform law to work with the private sector, to give employers specific tax incentives to hire people off welfare, and to do some other things which will create more jobs in the private sector, at least a million to move more people from welfare to work. It's very important. And I, I hope we get a chance to talk about this more. There's not a more important issue. I, I still remember a woman that I met 10 years ago who said she wanted to get off welfare so her kids could tell, give an answer when they say, what does your mother do for a job? I met that woman again. She's got four kids. One's got a good job. One's studying to be a doctor. One's in technical school. One's an honor student in high school. I want to make more people like that woman really hard. So I've got a plan to do it. And it's just beginning. Well, another thing we can do, we talk about growth. We've got a great economic package, which I hope we'll discuss later. Across the board tax cut, child credits, $500 per child under 18, reduce the capital gains rate, create more jobs and opportunities for people on and off welfare. We have other provisions, less litigation. The trial lawyers, big supporters of the president. The trial lawyers, of course, they like lawsuits. So every time they have a bill that they want veto, the president vetoes it for them. We've got to understand in America that we've got to have growth, create more jobs and more opportunities in the private sector. The president takes credit for all these people off welfare, the governors did that. The federal government doesn't do that. And the government doesn't create jobs. They're created in the private sector. This section, question? Yes, ma'am, on the back row. This is for the president. Mr. President, my name is Pamela Johnson, and I'm a landlord. My question is, does your party have any future plans to reduce the capital gains tax, especially for retired Americans? First of all, we have a big plan to reduce the capital gains tax when people sell their homes. Part of my tax package, which is paid for in my balanced budget plan, would exempt up to half a million dollars in gains from people when they sell their homes, which I think is the biggest capital gains benefit we could give to most <coughs> ordinary Americans. We also have uh, capital gains now for people that invest in new small businesses and hold the investment for five years. It was part of our other economic plan. And these are things I think that will go a long way toward helping America build a stronger economy and a better tax system. I think the most important thing to emphasize, though, is that we also have to help people in other ways to build a strong economy. And we can't have any tax cut that's not paid for. One of the big differences between Senator Dole and myself is that I told you how I'm going to pay for every penny of the tax cuts I recommend. We've worked hard to bring this deficit down, and that's helped people in the real estate business. Because the interest rates are lower, we've got home ownership at a 15-year high, we've got this country going in the right direction. So we can have a tax cut, but my priority would be to help the families who need it with child rearing and education and buying a first-time home and helping for health care costs. So from your business, helping and buying the first-time home, exempting the capital gains on the, on the sale of the home would be the most important things that you ask about. Thank you, Pamela. Well, Pamela, what, what the president didn't tell you that all his tax cuts expire at the year 2000, but all these increases go on forever. That's the liberal approach. You know, give you a little tax cut, give you a couple of years, but then make the tax increases go on forever. So the net tax increase in his plans somewhere between 60 and 80 billion dollars. We have in the Dole Kemp economic plan, unless your home's worth over 500 thousand dollars, and if it is, you're, I appreciate it, congratulate you. But in any event. No tax. And that's it's a good idea they saw and they picked it up and put it in theirs, but it's only temporary. Ours is permanent. Ours is a good plan. Create jobs and opportunities. Capital gains rate, cut it in half. Cut it from 28% to 14%. There's $7 trillion in assets locked up in America. If we cut the capital gains rate, I'm told every day, I had a letter from a former constituent in Kansas saying, I want to sell property in California, put it in my business in Kansas. I can't because the capital gains rate is too high. We need to get the economy going. That'll help Social Security. That'll create more jobs. That'll help people who want to get off welfare. It's the American way. Before Senator Dole left the Senate, he and Mr. Gingrich also were recommending that we 
pass these tax cuts only insofar as we could pay for them. And we all assume that the tax cuts will be permanent, but we have to prove we can pay for them. After he left the Senate, we abandoned that. That's why most experts say that this tax scheme will blow a huge hole in the deficit, raise interest rates, and weaken the economy, and that will take away all the benefits of the tax cut with a weaker economy. That's why we have to balance the budget, and I'll tell you how I'm going to pay for anything I promise you, line by line. You should expect that from both of us. All right, the next question is for Senator Dole. And yes, ma'am, right there. My name is Melissa Nadine, and I'm a third year student at UC San Diego. And I just want to say that it's a great honor representing the Voices of America. My, voice, my question is concerning you, Mr. Dole. Um, all the controversy regarding your age, how do you feel you can respond to the young Voices of America today and tomorrow? Well, I think age is very, you know, wisdom comes from age, experience, and intelligence. And if you have some of each, and I have some age, and some experience, and some intelligence, that adds up to wisdom. I think it also is a strength. It's an advantage. And you know, I have a lot of young people who work in my office, work in my campaign. Uh, this is about America. This is about, somebody said earlier, one of the first questions, that we're, we're together. There's one America, one nation. I'm looking at our economic plan because I'm concerned about the future for young people. I'm looking about drugs. The president's been AWOL for four years. I'm looking about crime. He'll claim credit now for crime going down, but it happens because mayors and governors and others have brought crime down. Rudy Giuliani, mayor of New York, brought crime down 25% just in New York City. But of course, the president will take credit for that. My view is, we want to find jobs and opportunities and education. This year, the Republican Congress, as far as student loans, went from $24 billion to $36 billion over the next six years, a 50% increase, the highest appropriation ever, $6 billion for Pell Grants, very, very important. We also raised the amount of each Pell Grant. In our economic plan, the $500 child credit can be used for young people, rolled over and over and over. You're, of course, not this age, but if you have a child, two years old, 7% interest be worth about $18,000 time that child was ready for college. I can only tell you that I don't think Senator Bill was too old to be president. It's the, uh, <clears throat> the age of his ideas that I question. You're almost not old enough to remember this. But we've tried this before, promising people on election year tax cuts that's not paid for. We tried it last time you ran. Telling you can have everything you got. And so let me just say this. Did you hear him say the Congress just voted to increase student loans and scholarships? They did after he left. The last budget he led cut Pell Grants, cut student loans. I vetoed it when they shut the government down. My plan would give students a dollar for dollar reduction for the cost of a typical community college tuition, a $10,000 deduction a year for the cost of college tuition, would let families save in an IRA and withdraw tax free to pay for the cost of education, and it's all paid for. My whole administration is about your future. It's about what the 21st century is going to be like for you. And I hope you'll look at the ideas and thank you. Well, when you don't have any ideas, I guess you say the other person's ideas are old. As I said earlier, they don't have any ideas. Their idea is to raise taxes and spend more money. That's the liberal philosophy. That's what you like. You've got a perfect candidate. President Clinton came to California in 1992. He said, the centerpiece in my first four years is going to be a middle class tax cut. Now, all you got that tax cut, congratulations, because you got a big tax increase. You got a $265 billion tax increase. And he stands here and says, politicians who make promises like that ought to be ignored. Well, he made the promise. I keep my word. And you'll have a tax cut. It'll help you in whatever you're going to do the next few years. Thank you. Next question is for President Clinton, and it's from the. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Hello. My name is Tracy Sanders. And my question is do you feel that America has grown enough and has educated itself enough? to totally cut out affirmative action? No, ma'am, I don't. I am against quotas. 
I'm against giving anybody any kind of preference for something they're not qualified for. But because I still believe that there is some discrimination and that not everybody has an opportunity to prove they're qualified, I favor the right kind of affirmative action. I've done more to eliminate programs and rate affirmative action programs I didn't think were fair and to tighten others up than my predecessors have since affirmative action's been around. But I have also worked hard to give people a chance to prove that they are qualified. Let me just give you some examples. We've, we've uh, doubled the number of loans from the Small Business Administration, tripled the number of loans to women business people. No one unqualified. Everybody had to meet the standards. We've opened 260,000 new jobs in the military to women since I've been president. But the Joint Chiefs say we're stronger and more confident and solid than ever. And let me give you another example of what I mean. For me, affirmative action is making that extra effort. It's sort of like what Senator Doe did when he sponsored the Americans with Disabilities Act and said to certain stores, OK, you've got to make it accessible to people in wheelchairs. We weren't guaranteeing anything, anybody anything except the chance to prove they were qualified a chance to prove that they could do it. And that's why I must say I agree with General Colin Powell that the, we're not there yet. We ought to keep making those extra effort affirmative action programs the law and the policy of the land. Senator Bill? Well, we may not be there yet, but we're not going to get there by giving preferences and quotas. I, I supported that route for some time. And again, I think it's back to experience, a little experience, a little age, a little intelligence. And I noticed that nobody was really benefiting except a very small group at the top. The average person wasn't benefiting. People who had the money were benefiting. People who got all the jobs were benefiting. It seems to me that we ought to support the California Civil Rights Initiative. It ought to be not based on gender or ethnicity or color or disability. I'm disabled. I shouldn't have a preference. I would like to have one in this race, come to think of it. But I don't get one. <laughs> Maybe we can work that out. I get 10 points spot. <laughs> so, this is America. No discrimination. Discrimination ought to be punished, but there ought to be equal opportunity. We ought to reach out and make certain everybody has a chance to participate. Equal opportunity, but we cannot guarantee equal results in America. That's not how America became the greatest country on the face of the earth. I, mean, I have never supported quotas. I've always been against them. <clears throat> I don't favor equal results. But I do favor making sure everybody has a chance to prove their competence. The reason I have opposed that initiative is because I'm afraid it will end those extra effort programs. Again, I say, think of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Make an effort to put a ramp up there so someone in a wheelchair can get up. You don't guarantee that they get the job. You guarantee they have a chance to prove their competence. And as I said, this is not a partisan thing with me. General Powell, Colin Powell said the same thing. He fears that the initiative would take away the extra effort programs. No preferences to unqualified people, no quotas, but don't give up on making an extra effort to ensure everybody has a chance to prove they're qualified. All right, the next question is for Senator Dole, and it comes from this section right here. In the back row there in the blue shirt. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name's Tim David. I'm a mechanical engineer. Senator Dole, how do you reduce taxes and balance the budget? Oh, I'm glad you asked. What's oh your first name? I am too. <laughs> Tim. I first want to say the president didn't quite give you all the stuff on the on quotas because the Justice Department entered what we call the Piscataway case up in New Jersey. It's pretty clear that was a quota case. And just because one teacher was white and one teacher was black and they had the same qualifications, you know, they decided who would stay there. It shouldn't be that way. Now the president can say, well, he must amend it, not end it. There are 168 federal programs and allow quotas, he ended one. Now, this economic package, Tim, I'm glad you asked, because you look like the type that might be able to benefit from the 15% across the board tax cut and $500 per child tax credit for you know, state tax relief, which you're not interested in right now, but capital gains rate reduction. If you're taking care of an elderly parent, you get a $1,000 deduction. We think that's very important, because a lot of people take care of their parents. How do we pay for it? going to have a constitutional amendment to balance the budget, which the president opposed and defeated. He twisted arms, got six Democrats to vote with him. We lost by one vote. We're going to balance the budget by the year 2002. The president wants to spend 20 percent more over the next six years. I want to spend 14 percent more and give that 6 percent back to the people. Remember, it's your money. It's not his money, and it's not my money. 
It's your money. And you shouldn't have to apologize for wanting to keep all you can of it. But he ought to apologize for wanting to take more and more. He wants to give you sort of a government tax cut that really doesn't mean anything. You know, one of the responsibilities of growing older, it seems to me, is being able to tell people something they may not want to hear just because it's true. When they had a $250 billion tax scheme, that is half the size of this one, this one's 550, they passed a budget that had $270 billion in Medicare cuts, the first education cuts in history, cut environmental uh, enforcement by 25%, took away the guarantee of quality standards in nursing homes, took away the guarantee of health care to folks with disabilities. Don't take my word for this. Uh, the Economist magazine polled lots of economists, seven Nobel Prize winners have said, if this tax scheme passes, it will require huge cuts, 40% in the environment, in law enforcement, in education, will require bigger cuts in Medicare than I vetoed last time. My targeted tax cut gives tax cuts for education, child rearing, buying a first-time home, paying for health care costs, and it's paid for. And I told you how I'll pay for it. He won't tell you because he can't. Your targeted tax cut, Mr. President, never hits anybody. That's the problem with it. Nobody ever gets it. But I, I, I must say I'm a little offended by this word scheme. You talked about last time you talked about a risky scheme, and then Vice President Gore repeated it about 10 times in St. Petersburg. Uh, if I have anything, in politics, it's my word. My colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, will tell you that Bob Dole kept his word. I'm going to keep my word to you. I'm going to keep my word to the American people. We're going to tax, cut taxes and balance the budget. We're not going to touch Medicare. It's going to grow 39%, and Social Security is going to go 34%. Now, the president doesn't have any ideas, so he's out trashing ours. This isn't going to blow a hole in the deficit. He promised you a tax cut in 1992. And if you got one, sir, you ought to vote for it. Next question is for the president. Yes, sir, right there. Quite sure. My name is Dwayne Burns. I'm a martial arts instructor and a father. Um, Mr. President, could you outline any plans you have to expand the Family Leave Act? Thank you. Well, first let me say that uh, I signed the Family Leave Act. It was my very first bill. And I'm very proud of it because it symbolizes what I think we ought to be doing. I don't take credit for all the good things that have happened in America, but I take credit for what I've tried to do to work with others to make good things happen. The most important good things that happen in America happen in families. Just about every family I know, the main concern is how am I going to succeed at work and still do right by my children? Family and medical leave has let 12 million families take a little time off for the birth of a child or a family illness without losing their job. I'd like to see it expanded in two ways. I'd like to say you can also take a little time off without losing your job to go to a regular parent-teacher conference or to go to a regular doctor's appointment with a family member. I'd also like to see the overtime laws changed so that we could have some more flex time so that at the discretion of the worker, the worker, if you earn overtime, you could decide whether you want that time to be taken in cash or in time with your family if you've got a family problem. I never go anywhere, it seems like, where I don't meet somebody who's benefited from family leave law. In Longview, Texas, the other day, I met a woman who was almost in tears because she'd been able to keep her job while spending time with her husband who had cancer. One of the people who's here with me today met a woman in the airport saying that her son just was able to be present at the birth of his child because of the family leave law. So yes, I think it should be expanded. We have to help people succeed at home and at work. Well, 88% of the people the president claims are 11 million are already covered. And only 5%, keep in mind, only 5% of the employers are even affected by the Family Leave Act. We had a better idea. We didn't win, but we had a better idea. Now we have a majority, we get a president. That was a tax credit to the employer. Instead of the federal government reaching out, we had a tax credit to pick up some of the cost, because if you have to hire a replacement worker, that's a cost. This is the way it ought to work give more power back to the states and back to the people, back to the taxpayers. Not always the long arm of the federal government. But keep in mind, this bill covers 5% of the employers. 95% of the employers and all those employees they employ are not covered in this act. And according to Investors Daily, which I read just a couple of days ago, 
the people he claims credit for were already covered in collective bargaining agreements or other agreements. We had family leave in our office, I'm certain. I see my friend Senator Mitchell, he had family leave. I worked every day with people. I spent a lot of time in hospitals. I know what it's like to be in a hospital. Sure, we want family leave. But there's a better way to do it. I only have 30 seconds. I can't fix the statistics. It covers the majority of the workforce. Employers of under 50 are exempted. The bill originally covered employers of 25 and more, but because of opposition, we went up to 50. Senator Dole led the opposition to it. He filibustered it. He said it was a mistake. He said it would hurt the economy. We've had record numbers of new small businesses and 10 and a half million jobs. It didn't hurt the economy. He still believes it's a mistake. I believe it was right. You can decide which of us you think are right. It's up to you. Next question for Senator Dole. Let's say, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name's Bridget Giannotti, and I'm a wife and mother of two sons from Carlsbad. And my question for you, Senator Dole, is, as the wife of a San Diego business owner, I see one of our biggest problems in the U.S. does not manufacture enough of our own products. How would you help this problem out? Well, right, we've lost 357,000 manufacturing jobs. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics say today, said today that they made a mistake. It's probably going to be a much, much higher figure. So we're talking about all these new jobs. We better wait and see what the results are. We're going to do that with a more aggressive trade policy. We're going to do that with an economic package. We're going to do that with regulatory reform. You know, regulations cost the average family right here, Democrat or Republican, about $7,000 a year. $7,000, it's like a tax. Put a lot of people out of business. I met a lady in Colorado Springs about seven weeks ago now. She had a small business with 63 employees. She finally gave it up. Why? Because of paperwork and regulation. Congress passed the Paperwork Reduction Act. The president exempts the IRS, which creates three-fourths of paperwork. We're going to have regulatory, we're going to have litigation reform. You know, I fell off the platform out in California, Chico, a while back. Before I hit the ground, my cell phone rang. And this trial lawyer says, I think we got a case here. You know, <laughs> we got to stop some of these frivolous lawsuits that are putting people out of business, men and women. Get the economy going. Cut the capital gains rate. Create more jobs and opportunities for everybody in America. That's what we will do. And my word is good. I keep my promises. I don't break my promises at the election. And I don't make new promises on an election year. We're going to get it done. We're going to grow some of these jobs in America because we need to get it they're going the wrong way. Let's look at the facts. We lost a lot of manufacturing jobs in the 12 years before I became president. We've gained manufacturing jobs since I've been president. We've negotiated over 200 separate trade agreements. Let's just take California. In California, we made $37 billion worth of telecommunications equipment eligible for exports for the first time. We're selling everything from, from telephones to CDs to rice in Japan. We're selling American automobiles in Japan now. I visited a Chrysler dealership in Japan. We're number one in automobile manufacturing production and sales around the world again for the first time since the 1970s. Why? Because we've had tough, aggressive trade policies and because we got interest rates down and we had a good, stable economic policy because we've reduced the deficit four years in a row for the first time in the 20th century that a president's done that in all four years. And that's why I don't want to see us blow a big hole in the deficit with a tax program we can't pay for. So your interest rates will go up and you'll have to pay back in higher interest rates what you allegedly will get in a tax cut. So I say keep working on expanding the markets. More than half of these 10 and a half million new jobs are in higher wage areas. And we'll have more manufacturing and more sales at home and around the world. Well, you may think the biggest employer in America is General Motors. But I got news for you. It's manpower services hiring people temporarily who've lost their jobs, they go to work for 30 days or 60 days. That's a good economy? I don't think so. They're setting new records this year. We have the worst economy in a sense. We have the slowest growth, about 2.5%. The president inherited a growth of over 5%. We don't have the SNL crisis anymore. Republicans have cut $53 billion in spending. That's why the budget can get, look, look good. It didn't look too good the first two years when we had a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress. Next question is for President Clinton. Yes, sir. I'm Bob Goldfarb. I'm a travel agent. 
And can you please explain your policy on the Employment Non-Discrimination Act that would have prohibited discrimination, <clears throat> would have prohibited people from being fired from their jobs simply for being gay or lesbian? I'm for it. That's my policy. I'm for it. I believe that any law-abiding, tax-paying citizen who shows up in the morning and doesn't break the law and doesn't interfere with his or her neighbors ought to have the ability to work in our country and shouldn't be subject to unfair discrimination. I'm for it. Now, I have a little time left, so let me just say that I get attacked so many times on these questions, it's hard to answer all those things. In February, Senator Dole just said we had the worst economy in the century. In February, he said we had the best economy in 30 years. This February. And I don't want to respond in kind to all these things. I could. I could answer a lot of these things tit for tat. But I hope we can talk about what we're going to do in the future. No attack ever created a job or educated a child or helped a family make ends meet. No insult ever cleaned up a toxic waste dump or helped an elderly person. Now, for four years, that's what I worked on. If you give me four years more, I'll work on it some more. And I'll try to answer these charges, but I prefer to emphasize direct answers to the future, and I gave you a direct answer. Senator Dillon? Well, I, I'm opposed to discrimination in any form, but, I'm, but I don't favor creating special rights for any group. That would be my answer to this question. And I'm, you know, there'd be special rights for different, different groups in America, but I'm totally opposed to discrimination. We don't have any policy against hiring anyone, whether it's lifestyle or whatever. We don't have any policy that I never have had in my office or what we have in the future. But as far as special rights, I'm opposed to same-sex marriages, which the president signed well after midnight one morning, the dark of night. He opposed it. But I'll get back to the economic factors, because again, I think this is very important. If there's anything that's going to change America, it's get the economy to grow. The president inherited a good economy. Sure, the SNL crisis ended. We're selling assets. Got a Republican Congress cutting spending finally. And he said we've had the best four years ever. That's not true. We had only 1.2 million bankrupts who set a new record. Credit card debt's never been higher. I just told you about this manufacturing job loss, which is going to increase. We need a good, strong economic package. Let the private sector create the jobs, and they can do it. If, if you believe that the California economy was better in 1992 than it is today, you should vote for Bob Dole. I have worked so hard out here to help turn this economy around. Let me just give you one tiny example. In San Diego, where we had def some defense cutbacks, we funded a, a project with the University of California, San Diego, to use airplane composite materials to build lighter, stronger bridges a little project and a program that Senator Dole opposed. 